Hello. <laughs> um, so before I start, um, I'm just going to make you all indulge me in a selfie. Brilliant. Um, so I want to ask a question. I'm going to be that guy who makes everyone be interactive. Um, who is aware of Industry 4.0? Nobody. Uh, OK, a couple. Um, who's heard the term the third industrial revolution? OK. And how many of you feel like you know what it means? Not many. OK. So the first industrial revolution was, of course, the cotton mills and the industrial revolution, steam engine, blah, 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 blah. And the second industrial revolution was arguably the invention and kind of popularization of injection molding. The third industrial revolution was uh, digital manufacturing. So the popularization of digital manufacturing, which basically is just 3D printing and CNC milling. And now industry 4.0, because we decided that the fourth industrial revolution was, you know, it was getting old, we need a new term, um, is essentially the popularization of cloud technologies and the connectivity. So it's not just about your, twi your, your toaster tweeting at you when your bread is ready, but actual useful applications. And so with this in mind, I want to kind of contextualize what that means for craft, but also what it means for what's next in medical design. So this is me. Hi, I'm Paul. Uh, and I can do that. I just I love this photo. Uh, this was me in uh, Nittenau at the prosthetic uh, office where I worked with Denise. Um, and uh, it kind of that's how I usually dress, like a bit like a kind of cleaned up hobo, really. Um, and so uh, I can do that. Essentially, was a motto that uh, the sort of self-proclaimed slogan that came with cloud technology and digital fabrication for myself. I trained as an architect. Um, and then decided that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life drawing toilets. And so I started, uh, I started my own product design practice where I took uh, what I'd learned in terms of, you know, that sort of transferable skills that architects like to talk about. We all dress in black and have huge egos, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I started a product design company and I started working in 3D printing and not just using it as an application for, for manufacturing, but also trying to improve that technology and put forward the case that it isn't just about making crap at home, but real, uh, real life application. And with that, that discovery of cloud technology, I realized that I wasn't limited to my own skills, but rather could collaborate with others. Um, and what was really interesting for me was that not only was I doing new things that I never imagined I was going to do before, like music videos and interaction design and getting people to think about what their morning routines are through craft, if you want to, you know, we're in the crafts council, I'm going to use the word craft, um, but that I could do so much more. And so with that came the idea that makers and startups are the future. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, the big companies are no longer where the greatest innovations come from, but rather um, smaller people, smaller groups who aren't afraid of risk, who dive headfirst into an idea and just see what sticks. Um, and so with that in mind, um, when I started at Autodesk about 18 months ago, on the first day they said, do you want to build a prosthetic leg for the Rio Olympics? I was like, oh, yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> and I've never done anything like this before. And I'm not a prosthetic designer. And I'm not a prosthetician. And I'm not trained in any of this whatsoever. So I was learning all of this on the way. Um, and so really, that's sort of the future of making things. And I'm still sort of doing my contextualization right now. I apologize. I had about five coffees this morning. So I'm really, really buzzed. Um, and so, so the future of making things in Industry 4.0, all of this is just context for you until I get into the meat of it. But um, down there, that's how we build, whether it's at mass scale or just as an individual. You have your concept. You do your design. You go to production. You sell it, and then you operate and retire it. And so whether that means it becomes obsolete, or you just made something that was a little bit crappy, <coughs> Galaxy Note 7, um, uh, it does, it's not very sustainable in every aspect of the word. And so the future of making things is a lot more interesting, because we're rethinking not only how we design and how we build and how we craft, but also how we bring the user experience into things. And in the medical industry, that's hugely important. 
Because whether, you, whether you're a doctor and you're seeing a thousand patients, or you're like me and you're only working with one individual, there is something immensely personal about what we do in the medical industry. So that's where it begins. It begins, begins with that personalized experience. Whether it's just the wallpaper on your phone, or um, going to a company and getting uh, earphones that are molded specifically to your ear canal, personalization is a huge part of how we build now. And we collaborate. So small groups and individuals band together and they create something really great. And while you might not believe it, some of the greatest innovations are coming from places like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Whether it's just you know, consumer goods or incredible technologies, this is where those platforms exist. And as a result, flexible additive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing, 3D printing, CNC milling has become critical to that process. And so factories are paying attention to that. I use a MacBook. That's, um, that's been using subtractive manufacturing for almost a decade now. It's not very kind of scalable, but when you're Apple and you've got more money than cents, you can do that. Um, but there are also great examples out there, and I'll tell you about my 3D printed prosthetic later. And then for me, what's most interesting is that the customer experience is part of your craft process. You can speak to people before you've actually manufactured and built that thing, and you can be informed so that when you actually bring that thing out into the real world, you know that you've given people exactly what it is that they want. And then finally, connected services. So we just heard two fantastic speakers. I really loved what you were both saying. That was, I just blew my mind. Um, and so yeah, it really isn't about your, just your toaster tweeting anymore, but getting real information about what something is, how it works, and how you can make it better. So whether it's your smartphone having a firmware update so that it's faster and you get more uh, improvement out of it, whether, you know, I've Sony did something really fantastic recently where they wrote a firmware algorithm that increased the battery life so that you don't have to use more lithium ion, which is just horrendous for the environment. Um, but also you can get real information. And we did that with, with Denise. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finally jump into that after my very long introduction. So this is Denise. Denise is a German Paralympic cyclist. She won the silver medal uh, at the London Paralympic Games. And never stop spinning is her motto. And so last year in May, Denise um, approached Autodesk and said, hey, can we build a better prosthetic? And so Autodesk said to me, hey, do you wanna build a better prosthetic? And I said to myself, oh crap, I've never made a prosthetic. Um, so the prosthetic industry hasn't had a major in, uh, revolution since the 70s when they switched from wood to plastic. That's quite a long time since the 70s until now not to have innovated in any way. And they still build primarily in an analog fashion. And so if you're a patient, it takes about six to 10 weeks to get a prosthetic. And if you're a child, well, that's useless, because in six to 10 weeks, you've probably grown, grown about three inches, and so that thing is already useless to you. So really, what we're arguing about is digital versus analog. So here um, on the left, this is the leg that Denise was supposed to use at the London Olympic Games. I really want you to pay attention to that, supposed to use. And on the, on the middle and the right there are the two physical prototypes that I built before we made the production one that she used uh, in London. In total, I think we did about 76 design iterations um, digitally and only two physical manifestations before we built the production model. Now, unfortunately, that one on the left, um, there was a small error and so it was slightly too tight. And for someone like Denise, when you're racing at an Olympic standard and you have to do endurance racing, that's just, it's out of the question. And so she raced with a backup leg, which is a training leg, and so it's, pretty incredible that she won a silver medal. But more importantly, um, they wasted 12,000 euros in about three months of work on what is essentially, well, not essentially, is actually a paperweight. It's what I use at home to um, stack all my finances under right now. Um, so why do we do things digitally? Well, we do things digitally because it's better. Now, I know that might upset a lot of people in the room, but um, I want you to remember that digital doesn't mean the abandonment of analog or using your hands. The two have to go hand in hand. 
Um, and I certainly want to talk to you all about that more later, but I know I'm pressed for time. Um, and so this was a group that we built. So there's me in the middle, um, Mickey, my colleague in Munich, um, my other colleague out in San Francisco, and then my intern in Portland. And you can see already there's a problem here because we're all in different time zones. But if you look at a wider perspective, when I talk about collaboration and the way that we build, in reality, there are about 22 people all over the globe working on this project whether it was um, the people in France who I just took the project to and went, hey, what do you think about this? Does it look good? And they were like, mm, no. Um, or um, you know, the, the workshop technicians in, in, uh, in the US going, you want to 3D print what? Um, there are a lot of people involved. Um, the upside of it, though, is when you work in a connected world, you can work around the clock. Or as Denise would put it, we never stop spinning. So the first step for us was to talk to the prostheticians and say, OK, what's, what's step one? What do you do? Well, you take a plaster cast mold. And then they file that down. They do a positive, then they do a negative, and back and forth, and back and forth, until they finally have the end result. And that takes about a week. Well, within 15 minutes using a 3D scanner, I got something that was perfect immediately. And three days later, I had a 3D printed mold back to give to the prostheticians to say, is this good enough? And begrudgingly, they said yes. Um, so like, great. Concept proven. What do we do next? Well, we build a concept model. Um, and if you know anything about aerodynamics, putting holes in it is a really bad idea. Um, but I thought it looked cool. So I did it anyway. Um, and then a week later, we had Mark 1. And so by collaborating with the prostheticians and with the engineers, again, I need to remind you, I'm architect by background, not an engineer, not a prosthetician. We had this. And so uh, speaking to Denise and asking her about what are her needs, she, she tells me that she races in three major events, the velodrome and two road races. And there are three different bikes with three different riding positions, and as a result, three different prosthetics. Um, so we built a modular version of that, so that she could have one prosthetic that she could very quickly change out for the different bikes. She tested it out, it worked. Uh, the socket was a bit crappy, but again, because I'm not a prosthetician. So we took it back, we redesigned it. About 20 iterations later, we had the version on the right. She tested that one, it worked, great. And so we ended with this one, this is our final one, um, where we took all those different elements and then also added in some low-tech solutions. So 3D printing is considered high-tech, I'd argue that it isn't. Um, but this, this thing up here is just a little valve cap. And basically all that does is we screw that in and she wears a neoprene sock and every time her socket, her, her stump wiggles in the socket, it lets the air out and doesn't let the air back in. And I, I just like to point that out because people get obsessed with high, high tech solutions and I like to say that actually sometimes the simplest solutions are still the best and there's no need to fix what isn't broken. And so this is how we built it. Uh, it's 3D printed out of polycarbonate and we used some good old fashioned CNC milling. Um, could have done that bit by hand, but uh, I'm lazy. Um, and that's, that's the leg. So that's what, that's what we had in the end. Um, this is primarily up here because Denise asked me to do a pearlescent black and gold job and it was really hard. And I just want to point out how much hard work I put in. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'm going to skip over this video because I'm a bit pressed for time. But to give you a breakdown, uh, the carbon fiber leg that she was supposed to race with was 1.2 kilos, and the polycarbonate one that I made was 1.4. It took them 10 weeks to build hers, and I did it in 10 days. But more importantly, we created a digital archive of her stump over those 18 months. So rather than taking up loads of space with plaster cast molds in what I like to call the plaster cast graveyard, um, it was all digitally accessible now. So anyone she wanted to work with, anyone she wanted to collaborate with, she was able to. We were also able to reduce the prosthetician's workshop from a quite a large space into a laptop. So all the things that they have to test for bias, weight, um, force, buckle, what's going to happen under certain scenarios, we could, did, we could simulate this digitally and then prove it in the real world. But we did that in December last year. And, you know, Denise likes to say, never stop spinning. So um, we had nine months and we went, okay, how can we make this better? We ended up with this, which um, basically was going, hey, you know all that extra bit in the middle? Can we get rid of it? Yeah? Great. Um, and so we have this aerofoil shape. Um, and then Obama showed up. Um, he won't stop texting me. 
He's really upset right now. Uh, I'm kidding. This is, uh, this is genuinely only in here because it's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and Angela Merkel's there too. Um, but she kind of gets pushed to the sideline because Obama's there. Um, but most importantly, with that continuous design iteration and, and looking at it and improving it and gradually going through, we reduce it from 1.4 kilos down to 812 grams, which is even less than the carbon fiber one. It also performed as well, but most important, um, I keep saying most importantly, because everything's so important to me. Um, what was really striking for me was speaking to Denise and speaking to loads of prosthetic users. Carbon fiber is horrid. It's really rigid, and the human body is the opposite of that. It's incredibly squishy. And so when you put the two together, you end up with lesions, bleeding, bruising, swelling, all the nasty things you don't want to think about. And when you push that to an Olympic standard, it gets even more insane. So the challenge for us was how do you make something that can be comfortable but also high performance? Now, 3D printing was a solution because it allowed us to do variable skin thicknesses and use materials that weren't necessarily considered for this kind of application. When I told um, some of the other country engineers that I was going to use 3D printing, they laughed at me which um, I won't be smug. I promise I won't be smug. I can't hold that promise. I'm going to be super smug. Um, most importantly, with the 3D printing, what we could do is take the pain points, the areas where it was incredibly com uncomfortable for her, and give it flexibility. And where we needed to transfer power, we could in ensure that material, um, the natural material properties of polycarbonate were going to allow that to happen. And so the end result was that she won a silver and a bronze medal in Rio. And now I get to do this everywhere I go when I speak to a prosthetician. Um, but we've helped to, to create a new way of building prosthetics. We've reduced the manufacturing time down to 48 hours. And I'm, a room, I'm in a room full of creatives. So I'm assuming that 48 hours for everyone in here is two and a half working days uh, rather than a full week. Um, but because it's digital, a prosthetician only needs to spend 15 minutes with a patient before they can start building something and see the next person. And that 48 hours is essentially just a buffering time of machining. The 3D printing is only 23 hours itself, and the rest of it is post-processing. If you want it to just come out of the machine and be ready to go, well, it's ready to go. It's painting that took actually a really long time. Um, I'd like to leave you with this image. So on the left here, is essentially what she raced with in Rio. It's just take this and make it carbon fiber. Uh, this is what has now been dubbed the Obama leg. Um, this is another one of her training legs. This is an everyday walking leg, which is what we're working on now. That was the one that was supposed to be used in London. Um, that was our first production model. And then lastly, we took one of the 3D printed ones and we wrapped it in carbon fiber just to see if it would make a difference. It turns out not really. Um, actually made it a bit slower because you've added weight. Um, and so thank you. Uh, I, I apologize for the pace at which I spoke there, but I wanted to make sure I crammed everything in. <laughs>